Welcome to the Western Bell podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled Cultivating Resilience and Inner Strength on the Spiritual Path. The talk was given by Mary Angelon Young on January 23, 2021, via Zoom. Angelon is a workshop leader, editor, and author of As It Is, Under the Punai Tree, The Bal Tradition, Caught in the Beloved's Petticoats, Enlightened Duality with Lee Lozowick, and Krishna's Heretic Lovers. Angelon Young. Well, it's always a, really a pleasure and a privilege to um, share an evening like this um, together for me. And I, I really appreciate everybody coming. It's, um, it's very heart heartwarming and encouraging. So thanks so much for your presence and your participation tonight. This subject uh, is very um, near and dear to my heart. 2020 was definitely a year to um, access whatever um, inspiration and, and inner strength and resilience that we have and, and also to cultivate uh, resilience on the spiritual path. So that's the theme of my talk tonight, res cultivating resilience and inner strength on the spiritual path. But I'd like to expand that to be the path of life. Um, because, you know, here we are trotting along, walking, crawling, running a marathon, uh, you know, on the path, on life's path. Everybody is on that journey. And we can all relate to that, to that metaphor, birth to death. It's a big arc with many sub arcs within it of, of our experience in that journey. So after decades of treading a very traditional spiritual path, and by that, I mean uh, the path of personal transformation in relationship to the grandeur and beauty and sanctity of life, all of life as it is, uh, which we could call the beloved or the supreme being or the supreme reality. But for me, at this point in my life, there's no separation. So life is a spiritual path and, and, and it is inherently spiritual, whether we have realized that for ourselves or not. It is inherently spiritual for all beings. It's all merged within this within this web of life, this interconnected, amazing thing that, you know, the the, the Hindus have this myth of Indra's net. And I've I actually uh, talked about this, you know, pretty extensively back, I don't know, a couple of years ago in a Saturday night talk, Indra's myth. And just in brief, Indra's in Indra's net, the myth of Indra's net is um, Indra is the king of the gods in the Hindu tradition. And he oversees, he oversees the demigods specifically, like so the god of fire and the, the planetary gods and like that. And so he has a palace um, out up, up in the, you know, the, the celestial uh, endless heavens. And that palace is surrounded in all directions, above and below and on the sides and out into infinity in all directions with this luminous net, this interconnected, interwoven net. And at the nexus where each strand connects with another strand, there is a jewel. And when one of those jewels shines very brightly in a particular way, it affects all of the jewels. And of course, you know, quantum physicists have really picked up this, uh, this particular metaphor and used it quite a bit. But this is, for me, the metaphor of how it is that Life itself, the path of life, is inherently a spiritual path, whether we know it or not. So the question then becomes for us, um, have I realized it? And to what degree, to what degree am I participating in that um, incredible 
incredible process. My teacher, Leigh Lozowick, called this the great process of divine evolution. And I love that phrase because it says so much. And so he was talking about this as, um, as this, it, this inexorable, infinite, ongoing evolutionary process that all of life is involved in. And so that's, that's where I'm coming from tonight. Um, it's a growth experience. And um, we're all in different places, and and um, and that's good, and as it should be. So our questions are: What degree of awareness, participation, presence, and commitment am I bringing to the path of life or the spiritual path? And this has everything to do with whether or not we have resilience and inner strength on our particular spiritual path that we're on in the face of a chaotic and changing world. And that's one thing that we can, I feel confident that I can say that we all are very aware and acutely aware that we've been through some kind of epic journey in the last year. It's been transformational and not always easy. And and in fact, um, very deep and very, um, at times dark. So we've had to, we've had to really dig for some resilience at times. And, um, but I would like to go back to my general context for this talk. Um, many of you already know, uh, what I'm going to, a little bit of information I'm going to cover right now, but for those who don't, uh, my path is a, a bowel path, Western bowel path. And so what does that mean? (laughs) People will ask immediately, who are the bowels? And just very briefly, the bowels are a, um, a very disorganized, unorganized, loosely organized group of mystics and poets and yogis and um, uh, seekers after truth. Uh, they've been around for about 500 years in Bengal. And they travel from village to village singing their poetry and songs and their Dharma teachings, um, which they, they uh, encode their poetry and their music with, their, with the teaching. And so they're, they're quite amazing um, individuals. They have to renounce their caste status to be Baul, to, to be um, cultivating the inner spiritual culture of the Baul the caste status has to go, first of all. So they're very revolutionary, very iconoclastic. I love this about them. I really deeply am nourished by this about the Bowels. <clears throat> and they, that's, that's where they began is with this um, re- renunciation of their personal privilege or their caste privilege because they believe in the sanctity and the potential of every human being who's on this journey from birth to death here in this realm. They are, they are advocates for the potential in humanity to awaken, to awaken and take up conscious participation, presence, commitment, and, um, and awareness. They are very interested in creating within a spiritual culture within the individual. So this, uh, this kind of awakening or human potential, it happens in the individual. It's individual by individual that this kind of awakening can occur. And it occurs in degrees. And of course, then there's, you know, like sudden enlightenment and these kinds of things. But that's not so much what we're thinking about or basing our efforts on. We're more interested in, in just it's simple human awakening of the heart to begin there. My teacher, Lee Lozowick, um, he was a Western Bowl Kappa. And this is a Bengali word that basically we can translate as a madman for God. And he was. He was a madman for God. For many years, over decades of my life with Lee, I was immersed in this kind of Western Bowl culture and trained in it. And this deep belief in the sacred nature of human beings and all of life. This is a, a very, a, very much a bodhisattva kind of ideal, to use a Buddhist term, because it honors the human potential of every, every uh, being who is, who is here. It includes everyone and everything. 
And in fact, the uh, the Baals have taken a lot of their teaching and their practice and their philosophy and their culture, their spiritual culture, from um, ancient Tantric Buddhism, from Tantric Hinduism, and also from the Sufi tradition, which is very strong in Bengal as well. So the Baal perspective then is a uh, is tantric in that it is a non-rejecting and universal. So I'm I'm sharing these things with you because I want you to just keep in a general idea in mind of what is it that gives us access to resilience. So the bowels are non-rejecting. That doesn't mean that they don't make distinctions about what they will do and will not do, for example. But that they, what it means is that they accept reality as it is here and now. And then they choose what will be the correct or the Dharma. What is Dharma? What, what's the Dharmic course of action from that, from that place? Another aspect of Baal culture that's very rooted in the tantric traditions is it's established in the fertile ground of a loving devotional relationship to deity or divinity. However, you or, or any one of us as an individual might understand that or embrace that for ourselves. We can embrace it in the Saguna, which is a very personal chosen deity, or we can embrace it in the Nirguna, which is very impersonal. So in the impersonal, we might embrace deity and divinity as pure presence and pure awareness. It's a very, you know, perhaps non-dual, we would say. From the Saguna, we we would um, embrace that as as a deity, as um, you know, in some kind of form or image. Maybe Krishna, maybe Jesus, maybe Mary, maybe Kali. Um, and and among the Baals, they have many different many different ways of of this kind of worship. But this is really essential to this to tantric practice. So another aspect of the bowels is that they turn away from temples and rituals. And although they don't reject them necessarily, they're, they're putting their gold and their jewels into the here and now of wherever they are and whatever they are doing. They're putting all of their money on a direct experience of reality here and now and whatever that is, whether they're singing playing their Akhtara, or maybe they are in the, the great temple, the Kameshwari temple in, in uh, Assam or somewhere in Bengal, at, you know, in a temple to Kali or a Krishna temple. Wherever they are, they are interested in presence. And again, that comes from, not from out there, from some kind of deity in the sky, but from within the human heart. So. If we're interested in this kind of spiritual practice or this kind of relationship to life itself, then we can we can consider that we bring the same loving attention and awareness to nature, for example, to the clouds in the sky. Today was absolutely gorgeous here in the high desert because we're finally getting some rain after nine months of terrible drought up here in the mesas. And um, so the clouds were incredible. So the same loving attention, loving relationship and awareness to nature that we would bring to the altar the or a sacred space on an ashram or to our meditation seat. Is this making sense to everybody? And this is true all across life, you know, if we're cooking dinner, we're bringing that loving attention and awareness to what we're doing. This is very bowl. Of course, you know, the Zen, Zen Buddhists are really into many, 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 many paths. Of course, any contemplative path is going to be um, cultivating this kind of, of practice. So we are given resilience at birth by Mother Nature. Mother Nature blesses us with resilience. Resilience is already true of us. And we we understand it to begin with through our instinct. One of my favorite contemporary voices is Michael Mead, and he is a much uh, loved, uh, well known, renowned storyteller. 
He's also a scholar of anthropology, mythology, and psychology. And one of the things that uh, I, I um, discovered him saying recently is that we are blessed at birth with only two things, Michael says, the instinct to survive and the instinct to worship. So our survival instinct gets a bad rap a lot uh, as we're working with ourselves psychologically and in our spiritual practice. We're trying to unwind ourselves from being um, tense and rigid and, and, and tied up in our survival strategies that we've created as, as infants, children, and you know, and so on. Um, but at the same time, this instinct to survive also has within it the gift of resilience. So Mother Nature gives us resilience um, through our instincts. And last night, um, uh, I watched this in really incredible documentary. And uh, my husband, Thomas, and I watched it together. And it is called My Octopus Teacher. How many people have seen this? Those of you that I can see. Well, it's a must-see. It's absolutely incredible. It's the most beautiful documentary I've ever seen. And that's saying a lot, especially since in 2020, I saw a lot of documentaries while uh, sheltering in place. So it is is truly beautiful and extraordinary. And uh, you just won't believe it. I'm not going to tell you about it because I hope that you watch it and that you you can have this um, the pleasure and the joy and the surprise and the revelation uh, that I had uh, and that we had uh, watching it. But to learn more about this God-given, Mother Nature-given instinct for resilience, this go to this documentary, and you will see what I mean. It's very, very beautiful. This is just my introduction to this talk, and as I'm winding this down, we're going to move on to other sections of what I'd like to share with you. But I want to just remind you of a couple of things I'd like for you to keep in mind during the talk. Um, I'd like you to keep in mind these, these four um, qualities of a human being. Awareness, participation, presence, and commitment. And then I'd like you to add another word on that, which is responsibility. And I'll come back to that later. We have in the bowl tradition this possible revelation and insight. And, and uh, my teacher, Lee Lozawick, uh, languaged this as the body knows. So innate within our human body, this human potential that the bowels rever and seek actively. Um, innate within the human body, there is a place in which, at which we access knowledge that, that bypasses the mind and the conditioning. And this is um, part of our human, our legacy as a human being. Thoreau once said, in wildness is the preservation of the world. So let us then return to something wild and indigenous within ourselves as we move forward on our path to find our own instinct of resilience. Just one other, at this point, one other quote that I'd like to share with you. I love this quote, um, and I've shared it with some of you in, in past months. This is from the, uh, the teacher Martin Proctel. He is indigenous and, and European. He's both, and he's been trained in the Mayan sham shamanic tradition, and his books are fantastic at the top of the list of my must-reads. Um, but I love this quote. <clears throat> he says, it is necessary to praise life by how we carry out everything we do and wonder about. That way the world does not die. So with all of those things being said, what is resilience? I spend a little bit of time with this. Of course, we all know what it is, but I'm going to I'm going to kind of free range here on, on this subject. What is resilience? Resilience is the giant sequoia, the, the redwood growing a shoot of a new tree 
after its 1,000-year-old parent tree has been buzz-sawed to the ground for lumber. How does that happen? Where does that resilience come from? It comes from the ancient biome of the tree network underground. So this is a metaphor, of course, for the source. It's a metaphor. Nature is full of these. And it's um, this, this oneness, this source, is uh, really, of course, the ultimate place where, from, from which we receive the resilience that we need to be able to recreate ourselves again and again. Because we will need to do that, and especially as time goes on, as we age and grow older, and as the world continues to sort of spin out of control and in all kinds of crazy questions, like it's wobbling along, all kinds of crazy directions that it's, that it's going in. So the redwood is telling us that life goes on in one way or another, no matter what, and so do we. And that is resilience. How people are working with the chaos and madness of the world today. How are, how are people getting along? How are people you know, staying afloat amongst uh, counselors, social workers, and psychotherapists and psychologists? This past year in particular, this theme of resilience has become a very big thing. Because, of course... There's more and more depression and despair going around um, in the world in general. Individuals are feeling this. It, it, it's, it particularly strikes, um, <clears throat> depression particularly strikes women and girls, teenage girls, <clears throat> but nobody is immune. Nobody is immune to it. So from the psychological point of view, what is resilience? This is an interesting point of view. For me, it is positive adaptation to adversity. Innate resilience, we have it, it's innate, but it also has to be cultivated. So this is as true in the psychological sense. And again, I'm not making a big distinction between the psychological sense and the spiritual sense because it's all one continuous web of life. It's one continuous uh, woven fabric of continuity. This is a tantric perspective on it. In order for um, innate resilience to flourish in us and for us to have the wellspring of resilience that we need in the world today, then we do have to cultivate it. And so um, it's often compared to the immune system. We have an immune system. It can be very, very strong. But the immune system also has to be nourished. It has to be nourished with nutrients, with the right circumstances. It also needs to be exposed. Uh, uh, In order for the immune system to flourish, it has to be exposed some so that it can build the antibodies or the, or the, the capacity that it needs to be able to withstand infection, for example. So this is true also with resilience. We don't know that we have resilience until we are challenged. And it's in the very moment that we are challenged by life that we begin to realize what kind of resilience we have, how to access it, where our weaknesses are. How am I not resilient? How am I not uh, bouncing back from this blow, whatever it was or whatever it is? Resilience is that in us that helps us to just keep moving forward. We fall down, we trip, we fall, we, we lose our balance. Anyone who's ever had a fall knows how debilitating and shocking it is, what a tremendous shock it is to the system. But we have to get up and keep going. That's resilience. That spark of life within us, that upsurge of soul that will renew us so that we can carry on. So resilience is our ability to uh, take a wrong step, acknowledge it, and then move on. Resilience is our ability to learn from our mistakes. And hopefully we only have to make that mistake once. We don't have to keep making the same mistake over and over. I really... um, (laughs) 
I've made the same same mistakes over and over for years. And, and so I can speak to this. I know that it's very debilitating. At some point, we have to move on and go, that's enough. <laughs> I've learned this now. I'm not doing this again. That's uh, not always um, easily done. It's easier said than done often. So every time you fall, you get back up and you keep moving. Resilience is moving on in a positive direction. Try again. And not with guilt. And we all know this. Guilt is not going to help us. Guilt is actually going to, to block the flow of resilience. Guilt is a dead end. Honesty, commitment, self-knowledge, very, very helpful, very important. In fact, vital, necessary. We want to, and especially once we become aware that we are, that life is a spiritual path and that all of life is on a spiritual path, and we start bringing our awareness and our commitment and our presence to it, we want to persevere in being resilient so that we can fulfill our sense of purpose, to fulfill one's sense of purpose. And I'll come back to to purpose later. Um, Knowing intimately or having a sense of true purpose, and this is a lifetime work. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about obstacles to resilience, and we know what they are. So in fact, uh, (laughs) we can all chime in on this. But just to begin with, obstacles to to resilience begin with the trauma that we encounter as soon as we are born into this world. Like a spiritual teacher, Thomas, Dr. Thomas Hubel says, everyone who is born on earth has some degree of trauma because we are born into a traumatized world. And this is more obvious now than it has ever been. And of course, it's always been difficult to be in this realm. You know, 500 years ago, it was, there were plagues and endless wars and slavery and genocide and and the subjugation of women and children. It just went on and on and on. It's not easy to be on planet Earth. But right now in particular, there's trauma to the five elements. Not Well, especially four. There's trauma to water, earth, air, and fire. And so even at that level, we experience trauma as soon as we come, as soon as we arrive here. But we're also going to, of course, experience the shutting down of our natural of our natural the natural flow of our life force in the training that we receive in the impressions that we receive even before birth culture family religion be a good girl be a good boy you're a bad girl you're a bad boy so all of these things are the blocks within us as individuals that we're going to have to confront it, at some level, you know, ongoing healing process, which spiritual life very much is, my experience of it, it's a very much a healing process. It's a process of becoming whole. So I'd like to invite you all to share. So what are the obstacles to your resilience? Anybody? Anybody have anything you'd like to share? One thing that comes to mind is when we refuse to see and acknowledge reality. So our denial, if we can't see reality as it is, like you were talking about, and we turn away from it, and um, we choose instead, even though it could be coming from an unconscious place to stay in denial, um, I think that that's a great, great um, obstacle to resilience because we are stuck. And we are invested in our stuckness. Thank you. Denial. Now, what is it that stops the flow of life? Because resilience really is the natural flow of life. Everything keeps recreating itself. It's, it, there's, there's no end. It doesn't stop just because there's a, um, something happens that sets us back or knocks us down or that, that makes us die, makes us lose our body. We, you know, life goes on. And if anybody wants to um, uh, chime in here on this subject of obstacles to resilience, please uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself and let me know. I can say something else. Yeah, go ahead. 
um, along with denial is our refusal to grieve. Mm -hmm. So when we refuse to grieve what needs to be grieved, I think that that really blocks uh, resiliency in a very kind of at a, at a soul level, not allowing ourselves to grieve be another obstacle. I think that, that both of those things uh, fall into the very big uh, concern of the degree to which our feeling function has been shut down from the time we were little children. So whatever the healing process is, and this is not, I'm not going to go too deeply into this because it's a vast, huge subject. I'm sure we all have some, some familiarity with it, if not a lot of familiarity with it. But this, um, this is like the, the big, the big um, block to the flow of resilience. We have to be willing to feel and feel deeply underneath our emotional states because a lot of our emotional reactions is just drama and we we can be we can become (laughs) i've certainly observed it in myself addicted to our own dramas our own stories and they are endless and we never know when once when since somebody's going to push a button that we have psychologically some kind push on something that gets us going into one of our very reactive, very reacting, not responding to life, but reacting to life. And this is a this is a um, one of the ways that we continue to stay closed at the feeling level because we have to go underneath the surface emotions. We have to go much further underneath of all of that, our reactivity, our dramas, our addictions and compulsions. We have to go underneath all of that and work with it. How to do that is not the subject of our talks. We're going to keep going on about resilience, but this is just um, some grist for the mill, some some considerations, some some things to consider deeply. Inevitably, along the way, on the spirit, and this is particularly, you know, this is true in you know very in our ordinary day to day life in our family situations. It's true as a sangha, you know, on ashrams, um, that we are going to experience disappointment and we are going to um, have disillusionment. And so how do we access the resilience that we're going to need? Because these can be very real blocks to being able to recreate ourselves so that we're alive and juicy and we have what it takes to keep moving on in a positive direction. Holding on to the past. This is really a big one for everybody. Holding on to the past. I've um, I've really been, you know, finding a tremendous amount of food and nourishment in the books of Michael Brown, and he's a South uh, a South African man who um, he's written a number of books on. On and they're called on a particular process of healing, which is called the presence process. And he says, and I have to agree with him, I like the way he languages it, he keeps it really simple. He says that when we are caught up in the time, in the world of time, past and future, that um, we're locked into, we're locked into the past because the future is always a projection of the past. So his work is about getting people into the present moment so that in that place, in the present moment, we can begin to work with the quality of our experience of day-to-day life. For me, this is a very powerful place of personal inquiry. It's like, how is the quality of my experience day-to-day? You know, I've shared with with many of you before in these talks that my teacher Lee, you know, he he used to say to me, um, <clears throat> he was very he, he very much wanted me to be aware of my own suffering. He wanted me to know that I was suffering, and then I could work with it. But as long as I as I was in denial about my suffering, I really believed in all of my dramas and stories and 
I believed I was right. You know, I had this rigid stance. I'm right. They're wrong and all of that. But I can't make any inroad into the fact of my own suffering. And therefore, I can't. it's no longer workable. I can't transform it. And I can't, can't access the resilience that's underneath it. The clarity, you know, of course, that has to come first. So <clears throat> on a practical level, addictions and compulsions, of course, that these things um, are like veils over the wellspring the fountainhead of resilience that is within us. The way that we use cynicism, for example, to buffer ourselves and shield ourselves and deny the pain of reality because, because reality it, it's, can be very painful. And let me just say one more time, holding on to the past and worrying about the future. Worrying about the future. There's nothing we can do about the future. If we get into the present moment, then we can be moved in a positive direction that might make a difference about whatever it is we're worried about that's going to happen in the future. But as long as we're just stuck in being worried about it, we become, I've experienced it myself, I become. Um, not only uh, le- like lethar- lethargy can set in, um, indecision can set in, doubt, all kinds of things that just keep you in suspended animation. Like you can't move, for, you can't like be in the flow of life <clears throat> because we're stuck. Stuck. It's a great word. Um, it's one of those words that sounds like what it is stuck. So this thing of control, having it my way, you know, courting the rigid stance, having a position about things. Of course, the ever-present projection, assumption, expectations, and identifications. I want to share this quick quote from Joanna Macy. She's a Buddhist teacher. She's written many, many books. They've been translated into countless languages. This is a quote from her on the importance of feeling. Quote, the refusal to feel takes a heavy toll. Not only is there an impoverishment of our emotional and sensory life, flowers are dimmer and less fragrant, our love is less ecstatic, but also this psychic numbing impedes our capacity to process and respond to information. The energy expanded in pushing down despair is diverted from more creative uses, depleting the resilience and imagination needed for fresh visions and strategies. So cultivating resilience. We're moving along here now to cultivating. I think we know what the blocks are and what the obstacles and the challenges are. We probably know them as well as we know the back of our hands, right? So cultivating resilience. One of the elders in the Jungian world, um, the the world of the teachings of Carl Jung, his name is James Hollis. He's 80 years old. And of course, he's a, he, he was trained in Zurich, Dr. James Hollis. He's also written, I don't know, 16 books or something. He has a new book out. It's called Living Between Worlds. And it's about accessing personal resilience. And I haven't gotten the book yet, but I'm very interested in it. And he says that one of the first things that we have to do to become resilient is that in whatever way we have lost a sense of self-agency, where we are responsible for ourselves, we are our own advocate He says, this is the first step that we have to reclaim our self-agency. I am responsible for myself and I do know what is true. I may have to work some to get access to it, but I do know. If we don't learn it for ourselves, if we don't don't come to it on our own, if somebody else just tells us, this is how it is, this is what you should do, this is the truth. You know, Lee used to say, 
so often in his talks, particularly in Europe, and he would say, don't take my word for it. He would be giving, you know, a whole seminar, a weekend of teachings. And he would say, don't take my word for it. Verify it for yourself. Find it out for yourself. And so this is what this reclaiming your self-agency is about. So that's the first thing. The second thing, access your feeling life. So this may or may not involve an active healing process uh, for you or for me. Uh, Maybe we've done a lot of that kind of work and we just find that we're at a point in time when we need a refresher, a refresher course in learning how to access what we are actually feeling. Reconnect to the earth as a living, sacred being. Here is an endless source of resilience. Nature, however that works for you to connect with it, whether it's walking in the park or going fishing or or forest bathing, my personal recent most recent favorite, although I love everything about nature. <clears throat> I always have. Reconnect to the earth as a living, sacred being, an infinite source of resilience, of inspiration about resilience. You inspire us to become more and more resilient and to nourish that in ourselves. Okay, the next thing I have here, know who you are. So here's another quote from my friend Michael Mead. He says, no matter the time in history or the place in the world, the greatest cause of despair comes from not knowing who you are. So much of the spiritual path, so much of this path of life is about finding out who we really are, not who someone else told us to be, not who our parents thought we were. Many of us never felt seen at a deep level by our families of origin. Go on a search inside yourself and in your life to to find the patterns that connect you to living myth and the mysteries. Ask yourself the question, why does this keep happening to me? Why was I so surprised by what happened, once again, throwing me off balance? Really? I have to do this again? Actively seek a sense of meaning and purpose. So again, we're talking about cultivating resilience within. What are the ways that we cultivate resilience? Actively seek a sense of meaning and purpose. Human beings are the symbol-making animal. That's who we are. So how can we connect to that world of symbols? What does that have to tell us about who we are and the patterns in our lives? Look for ways that we're reacting. How am I reacting? How am I, um, where where do I have a charge I've got an endless story, an endless drama and charge and reactivity going on about this thing in my life. Because when it comes to being able to to bring awareness to our participation and our commitment to our spiritual path, to the path of life, um, we want to begin to cultivate an ability to respond and not to react. This is a lifetime piece of work. It's a huge piece of work because there's always going to be that thing that always catches us by surprise. Does anybody else have this experience? Can I get a witness? (laughs) Okay. Seek love instead of power in life, in your relationships. Seek love instead of power. Seek cooperation rather than competition. This builds resilience in us. You know, um, Darwin, who I'm not terribly fond of, (laughs) Charles Darwin, did a lot of damage. Uh, One of the many patriarchs who did a great deal of damage because he put out this scientific theory that everybody bought hook, line, and sinker about the survival of the fittest. And that the whole movement of nature, the whole impulse of nature was predatory and competitive and it's so exciting to see these cutting-edge scientists begin to dispel this 
begin to begin to give us some a whole different view of life and how actually what's going on is a whole lot of cooperation. And yes, of course, there's 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 um, there are predators. There there is, and it's true. There is survival of the fittest, but that's not the whole picture. That's just one part of a big picture of interconnectivity, of mutually beneficial relationships between animals, animals and plants, between trees, between everything. So seek love instead of power. Seek cooperation rather than competition. And be aware, just, you know, know ourselves well enough to know that when we're going for power, to to know ourselves well enough to know when we're going for competition and not for cooperation. So here's another, another key to resilience, letting go. I gave a whole talk several years ago, just titled The Art of Letting Go. These are my drums that I like to beat in different rhythms, you know, but I'm always beating these drums on uh, for myself. Where's my feeling funk? What do I feel? Am I responding or am I reacting? And of course, I get to see myself reacting. It's not always pleasant, but it's necessary work. I get to see when I'm seeking power instead of love. I get to see when I'm really holding on. Because if I'm holding on, the power and the magic of resilience can't have its way. It can't flow. It can't take over my life and transform something that needs transforming. Letting go. Uh, Here's a great quote from uh, Father Richard Rohr. He's a Franciscan monk. He's now probably about 76 years old, very beautiful man, revolutionizing um, theology in the Catholic Church in great and wonderful and marvelous ways. And so here's one quote from him. All great spirituality is somehow about letting go. Isn't it true? So here's another one. This one's really simple in some ways, but very hard. Simple but not easy, let's put it that way. Respect, respect, cultivate respect. Respect for yourself, respect for life, respect for resources, respect for the other, respect for everything. A deep mood of respect, because gratitude lives really close to respect. And of course, gratitude is a grace that visits us and hopefully comes to stay because it likes the climate. It likes the the beauty of our inner heart. It likes the beauty of our inner being. So maybe gratitude, grace in the form of gratitude will come to live with us. Respect helps build that beautiful inner, inner culture, that inner temple. Brokenheartedness and vulnerability. There's a quote from Joanna Macy, who I, I quoted earlier. The heart that breaks open can contain the whole universe. Here's another one, Mary Angelon's list of things that might help us be resilient or access our native resilience. Being flexible in the moment. Being able to wait and exercise discipline. Here's another one. Self-care. This is a hard one for some of us. It's been very hard for me. Self-care leads to basic sanity, stability, equanimity, and seeing with the heart, insight, to be able to look within, to see with the heart. That's how important self-care is. Some of us, including me, feel like that, you know, we're being selfish or we're not being productive. We're not getting like work done, you know. So self-care is the the last thing on the list of things to do and that doesn't happen. But actually, this is how important it is. From self-care can come everything else, all of our creativity, our basic sanity, our stability, our equanimity, our seeing with the heart. And here's another one. Know your personal dharma. Know your personal dharma. Here's a quote from Anandamai Ma, the incredible 
Ananda Maima. The path of awakening is entirely unique to each individual so that you become a path unto yourself. And uh, the last one in my list, although, you know, the list could go on, there could be much longer. There's lots to say on this subject. But the last one I have for tonight is, um, is seek imagination. One of the points that uh, Michael Mead makes in his, in his books and in his podcasts is that our situation in the world, which is, of course, a reflection of our inner situation, it's too complicated. There's no one answer that's going to fix everything. And that the only way that we can move forward is with imagination. The imagination that can bring fresh ideas. And one of the ways that we can begin to prime the pump of our imagination is by accessing living mythology. Because myth speaks to the imagination. It's the language of the imagination. So what I'd like to do is tell you a story. I think we have time. It's such a great story. This story is called The Myth of Ur. E-R. And this myth was written down by someone named Plato, who you may have heard about. <laughs> the myth of Ur. So the, the story of Ur takes place, it opens up at the end of a huge battle, and the battle has been lost. And there's a pile of dead bodies on the battlefield. And Ur one of the individual men who was a warrior in that battle, he is still alive, but he's lying underneath the pile of dead warriors. And he's wondering what's going to happen next when suddenly the, the warriors begin to get up and they've fallen on the battlefield, but they get up and they begin to walk. And so he just follows them all. And before long, they, they find themselves, first of all, the, a spirit guide arrives, a guide of some kind arrives and instructs them and tells Ur specifically, says Ur, comes to Ur and says, I want you to remember what's going to happen next. And so they move along through this, um, this plane, this vast plane, and then suddenly they find themselves magically transported instantly transported into the center of the universe, a place of vision and wonder. They're in the center of the whole cosmos, a great sphere where they see a huge, enormous, infinite spindle and a loom. And there at the loom is a goddess. Her name is Anante, and she is the goddess of necessity. So they, they are, of course, awestruck. They can't, they're, they're amazed. They're speechless. They're, they're wonderstruck. Here they are at the center of the cosmos, at the feet of this goddess, and they're getting this opportunity to see this and experience it. So she's the goddess of necessity. Sitting at, at her knee are her three daughters. And her three daughters are the three fates. So Ur watches very, very, you know, again, wonderstruck and amazed. He just, he, he's, what can you say when you're in a state like this and, and witnessing such an incredible, incredible scene where all of the dead warriors, they're instructed to go past each one of the three fates, the three daughters of the goddess of necessity. And they are on their way back to take rebirth. They're going back to the earth that they just left. But first, they must pass, pass through each one. They must be, they must be um, initiated by each one of those three daughters of the goddess of necessity. So Ur watches as the men go through. And they stop first. They stop first at, at the goddess named Lachesis. And she is the dispenser of lots. She is the dispenser of fate. And she says to each person as they come through, now you will choose your lot. Now you will choose the fate that you will have in this next life when you go back to earth. 
And when the individual person has chosen that fate, chosen that lot, picked his lot, then she gives him a genius, a genie, we could say, but a particular genius, a spirit, an indwelling spirit, an indwelling helper that will be with that that man, because these are all male warriors, be with that man all the way through his next life. And so he receives that genius. Now he has his lot. His lot is cast, as we say, and he moves on to the second daughter. The second daughter of the goddess of necessity, her name is Clotho. And we get, obviously, clothes and cloth and these kinds of words from this. She's called the spinner. And what she does is she looks at this individual man who's standing in front of her now with his lot that he's just gotten. And she spins an invisible thread that will run throughout his life, that will be the continuity of that lifetime. But she gives the thread uh, in in the weave of the lifetime, she gives it what's called a twist of fate. There's a twist of fate that that man will experience. And it's that very twist of fate that will make him unique. And so he goes on to the next daughter of the goddess of necessity, and her name is Atropos. And her function is that she makes the destiny of each individual irreversible. She tightens the strings on the fabric of the tapestry of that life so that it cannot be changed. Then each man passes beneath the throne and the knee of necessity and receives her blessing. So Ur watches as all this is going on and all of the warriors go through and then Ur himself goes through. And then the guide who's been helping him along through this, he says, he says to all of them, he says, now keep going. We're leaving, we're leaving this incredible, uh, uh, that fateful web of space time here in the middle of the cosmos, we're leaving this and we're moving toward that plane, that vast plane over there. And don't look back. You're not allowed to look back. And so all of the men, you know, keep going. <clears throat> and after each had chosen the shape and aim of the life they would live on earth, the entire group crossed a desert like area. After traveling for a time in the scorching heat, They found themselves at a strange place called the Plain of Forgetfulness. And here they were instructed toward evening as they encamped by a wide river that they should drink from the water of this river. And Ur was the only one among them who learned that the name of the river was the River Fleth, the River of Forgetfulness. So each one drank from the waters of of oblivion, and they forgot everything. Everyone forgot but Ur, because, of course, he had been instructed to remember. Only Ur did not have to drink the waters of forgetfulness. Somehow, Ur, of course, manages to return to Earth, and and, and the, the guide tells him, go back and tell everybody about this. Everybody else is forgotten but you are going to remember. So now where Plato got this, uh, this myth, this story, we have no idea because he wrote down many things that were mysterious and magical and edgy. But the thing about a mythic story like this is that it's not intended for us to believe it. It's intended for it to stir our imaginations. And so let it be that for you. Let it just stir your imagination. Let it settle wherever it wants to settle in you for tonight. One of the great values of um, going to living myths for inspiration and to be able to understand ourselves as as symbol-making animals is that it helps us to live with paradox. And that's the next uh, part of my what I would like to share is the importance of living with paradox when it comes to cultivating resilience and our ability to carry on in an inspired way 
to, in our ability to move forward in a positive direction. Living into paradox. Um, so I'm gonna I'm going to um, share a couple of things with you. I really I like this book. Uh, Father Richard Rohr has written many books, but this one is uh, I think a little more universal. It's called The Naked Now. And I'm going to read a couple of things that he has to say about paradox and the importance of paradox, why we have to have it, because it's clear that life is full of paradox. He quotes Alan Watts as saying that the loss of paradoxical thinking is the great blindness in our civilization, which is what many of us believe happened when we repressed the feminine side of our lives as the inferior side. It was a loss of all subtlety, discrimination, and a capacity for complementarity. Each one of us must learn to live with paradox, or we cannot live peacefully or happily even a single day of our lives. In fact, we must even learn to love paradox, or we will never be wise, forgiving, or possessing the patience of good relationships. Reality is paradoxical. If we are honest, everything is a clash of contradictions, and there's nothing on this created earth that is not a mixture at the same time of good and bad, helpful and unhelpful, endearing and maddening, living and dying. We are all, without exception, a mixed blessing. Paradox is hidden and obvious everywhere and always, unless you have repressed one side of your very being. And he offers this simple definition of how he understands paradox. A paradox is something that initially appears to be inconsistent or contradictory but might not be a contradiction at all inside of a different frame or seen with a different eye. I am a big fan of uh, physics, and I don't understand a lot of it, but I really love studying it and through documentaries. Uh, <clears throat> so just a quick little piece on, uh, on quantum physics. Which uh, and, and astrophysics, which are filled with uh, logical impossibilities. Much of the universe seems to feed on paradox and the mysterious. Everything from black holes to dark matter to neutrinos, which are invisible and weightless, and yet necessary to keep matter and antimatter from canceling one another out. They have to be there, things that don't make sense otherwise. But no one can prove it because the scientific method cannot measure it or know it, except by its effects. We have all heard how light is both a wave and a particle, and scientists long ago gave up trying to prove it was just one or the other. It is clearly both, and at the same time. Now, how do you deal with facts of that nature if you are intelligent? This signals that you need a very different kind of intelligence. In both the worlds of religion and science, a certain kind of reductionistic Western mind is being forced to reframe itself. So this is, you know, really at the heart of resilience. How is it that we recreate ourselves? We don't know. But we can, because it's magic, because it's happening at the level, it's happening at such a, a primordial level that we can just intend it we can pray for help we can have an intention for it we can look for all these ways that the, these things that might block the the um the flow of resilience we can look for ways that we can cultivate it but ultimately it's very mysterious it's very very mysterious we have these two arcs of our lives, we have the outer arc of our experience, and then we have the inner arc. And those two sometimes meet, often they meet and weave together. But if we're not having enough of the inner being with ourselves, then we're then then we are easily thrown off. 
by the the madhouse of experience of outer experience. It's a holistic program. <laughs> you can't divide and separate the being and say, I'm not going to deal with this part of me. I'm only going to go to the light. I'm only going to go to the to the spiritual, what I consider to be spiritual. This is known as spiritual bypassing. And, and, you know, I've done plenty of it in my life. That's why I'm passionate about it and how I can speak to it because I've done, I've done it even, even knowing like it was inevitable that I would do it and inevitable that those around me would do, would do it. But at some point, if I want to keep going with my spiritual path, with my path of transformation, I have to deal with what I bypassed. So I started at the psychological level, what are the obstacles and the blocks? Just, you know, a brief going over those. But, but each time I come to that, that like hour of reckoning, that moment when I have to be with myself, I may have to wind through that whole labyrinth again before I can get to, you know, all of the things, the, the, more, uh, the, the, the more enjoyable parts of the journey having to do with, you know, the return to worship. You know, at the beginning, I was using Michael Mead's thing about we come in with two instincts, the instinct to survive and the instinct to worship. So for me in that process of working with uh, resilience at all these different levels of the the totality of my being, which is an integrative process, so again, it's not a process of splitting things off and compartmentalizing. It's a process, process of bringing it all together and integrating it in me. That's what I've learned is where real wisdom comes from. So, you know, at some point, we build the foundation of our working with inner resilience and we're able to return to the, the longing of the heart to worship from uh, Michael Brown. This is a quote. Karma is consequence. We are moving into a deepening awareness for ourselves. When it starts becoming apparent to us that what we used to call our good karma is entrapment in unconsciousness and what we used to call our bad karma is the key to our liberation into integrated awareness. So we might, you know, I might think like my disappointments, my despair, uh, depression, all of those things that come up in a life and and, and particularly in a life seeking uh, the process of transformation. All of this is going to be part of the process. I went through years of being deconstructive, everything coming apart of dissolution of my old life after my teacher died, after Lee died. So I could become very embittered about that, or I could recognize that it actually, that that all of that happening was the key to my liberation. Mm-hmm. It's one of the keys to my liberation. So this is not in any way to dishonor the profound and deep feelings of grief and loss that we go through and that that I've personally gone through. It is actually a deep honoring of it. This is a consideration from my teacher, Lee, as the teacher of many people who are on this uh, Zoom call meeting tonight. Uh, It's from his book, uh, Chasing Your Tail, His, his journal, one of his many journals. And he's considering this quote from uh, Vallabhacharya, the great uh, Bhakti teacher from the 15th century. Um, And the quote is, Bhakti is purifying and supports contradiction. And so it's directly talking about how Bhakti can help us live into paradox, live into This paradoxical, you know, and even love paradox as the way of being, of being able to um, to work with paradox in our in our practice and our lives on the path. This is from pages two twenty nine to two thirty one in Cross Chasing Your Tail. 
Lisa is saying that when the heart is awakened in the subtle body, it takes the perspective from which that which is paradoxical to the mind is simply what is as it is here and now, or just this. So to that awakened heart, there is no problem and there is no reaction. So Lee goes on to say, and now I'm quoting him, in its higher function, the heart has only the capacity to generate response to life's various situations, but no capacity whatsoever for recoil or reactivity. In its higher function, the heart is purely a mechanism of direct knowledge without all of the reflective elements which the mind is so expert in. And then he goes on to say, um, this is what true devotion calls us to, a life which is lived freely and fully and not depressed, repressed, suppressed, or bound, chained, and cuffed by logical thought. So uh, how do I cultivate resilience? I cultivate faith in my life. And of course, practice Practice for me is not about uh, the period of sitting in meditation for one hour at a certain time every day. Practice is the field of, of the, it's like the integrated field of life. It, it's continuous. It never stops. So of course, we take refuge in the path. Of course, we take refuge in practice, but practice as a context of life and not as a specific activity. Because we may even find on the spiritual path that we go through periods of time when those formal practices fall away from us and we are left with ourselves and the present moment. And that's what we have to work with. That's what we're being given to work with. Prayer, faith, contemplation, deep inner knowing, deep inner questing. And the thing is, is that this is cultivating the real faith, not the mental belief, not the mental certitude, but real faith. So Lee goes on. This is the last piece here. He's talking about how we must always struggle to raise our viewpoint, going from, he says, insanity to sanity, from immature to mature, from ignorant to wise, from childish to childlike. By not giving in to despair, though there will inevitably be times of frustration and even exhaustion, we can keep our attention where it belongs, therefore continuing to be fed by Davy's unending stream of nectar, growing imperceptibly or by leaps and bounds, but ever advancing on the path. So the way I understand this ever advancing on the path is that it goes back to the great process of divine evolution, that we are in a continued state of metamorphosis, growth, evolution. We are constantly being confronted with change. And the degree to which we can be resilient in the face of that is the degree to which we will find joy and fulfillment and ultimately wisdom.